everyone. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today, and we're excited to bring you another in our series of interviews with top leaders in healthcare IT. And today's guest is actually one we've written about before on Healthcare IT Today. He's done a ton of work in security, and the thing I like about him most is that he does a lot of work for other people, and he's willing to share that. And we're going to learn a little bit about uh, his latest effort today. And our guest is Christopher Frentz. He's AVP of IT Security at Mount Sinai South. NASA. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So I'm excited to learn about this new playbook that you're, you're offering. And uh, you know, we'll link to the old playbook too, so people can see all of the work that you've been doing. But uh, before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about yourself and about your organization. Sure. I'm Chris Friends. I'm the AVP of IT Security for Mount Sinai South NASA, and we're a hospital system located in Long Island, New York. That's awesome. Well, I'm coming to visit. I, mean, I may have to come. South NASA sounds like a place I need to visit, but <laughs> uh, that aside, uh, so give us an idea, you know, where are we at now with kind of medical device security? Uh, medical device security, I think it's a range. I think a lot of the work the FDA has been doing recently in terms of issuing guidance is working to improve a lot of the newer devices coming to market, although the improvements are still not universal but I think medical device security is still lagging in a lot of ways with one of the big challenges being that there's a lot of legacy devices still present in healthcare. And a lot of these legacy devices aren't gonna go away for anytime soon within healthcare because um, you have a device with a lot of vulnerabilities running Windows XP, running outdated operating systems, and these make a lot of these legacy devices readily exploitable. So for a long time to come, hospitals are going to have challenges keeping devices secure as well as challenges if an incident occurs, responding to the incident and how that incident can affect a lot of the medical devices on their network. Yeah, and I think people don't realize how long of a lifespan a medical device has because we're so used to computers being replaced every five years or you know three years that's, if it's a good organization, but it's not true with medical devices, right? No, that's not true at all. They often do have a very long lifespan and a, a lot of times those devices still perform the clinical function perfectly well. So right. one of the issues is, is medical devices tend to be A, very expensive, and B, they perform the clinical function very well oftentimes for years beyond the computer and software going obsolete. So a lot of clinical departments don't want to spend resources replacing a medical device that from their perspective still works perfectly well just because it has an old computer on it. They'd rather invest the resources into something else that can improve patient care. So because of that, legacy devices tend to persist for quite some time on hospital networks. Yeah, what a great point. They're still performing the clinical function. The problem is they're, they're putting a lot of other risks, right? So what are some of the common cases where a medical device is compromised? The most common case we see is actually with uh, ransomware or other things that impact the availability of the device. Well, I know there's been a lot of attacks that um, in proof of concept level, sure, you can change dosages on infusion pumps and things like that. The sure. fallout we see from most real world cyber attacks tend to be attacks that actually make the device uh, go out of service, something that impacts the availability of the device. And that's actually a huge concern for patient safety because anything that impacts the availability of the device is going to lead to a delay in patient care. If that system's unavailable, it can't be used to treat the patient, that causes a potential delay and any kind of delay in patient care has the potential for causing an adverse outcome for the patient. So that's the thing that concerns me the most with medical device security is things that are gonna impact the availability of those devices. Yeah, it doesn't matter if the device is still clinically viable if you can't access it. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a big problem. And it is interesting though, right? The headlines are so big about, oh, you changed the dosage or something that, that feels like a good headline as a, as a blogger, a journalist myself, right? Uh, you know, I have that understanding, but yeah, that's interesting that it's, it really is about you know, removing the dice device from service and, and the impact that could have on patient care. That's powerful. Um, you recently published a medical device incident response playbook. I know you had a number of collaborators, love to learn about them as well. But tell us what your thinking is behind this, this playbook that you've published. Sure. Well, first, I'll point out that I might be so lost around it. As you said, there was a bunch of collaborators. And I will point out that uh, Brian Russell, the uh, chair of the Cloud Security Alliance IoT Working Group, uh, was the co-lead for the, the project. So he was instrumental to the, the guidance coming out. But one of the things that we were uh, very concerned with was with uh, medical device incident response is that a lot of organizations tend to treat the incident response process as a one-size-fits-all process. Mm. And that necessarily doesn't work for medical devices. 
So consider a very common incident response tactic of unplugging a PC. Now that might work perfectly well for a PC, but you really can't do that for a respirator attached to a patient. Now that's kind <laughs> of an extreme and obvious example, but it really shows how there's a clinical impact to a lot of the actions you can take when responding to an incident. And one of the things we're arguing for is that more and more health systems need to begin to consider the clinical context in which a lot of the systems they protect reside. Uh, and one, you can make an argument that we should consider clinical context on the strategy side. So if we figure out how to protect the device, we want to prioritize a certain device over another device because it's more important to patient care. And secondly, during the incident response process, we have to think about how the incident response actions we're going to take are going to affect the clinical impact of the, um, in terms of patient care. So just to give a couple of examples of that, let's say we have two uh, CT machines. One's in an outpatient clinic and one is in an emergency room. If the CT machine in the outpatient clinic goes down, yeah, it's not ideal, but you cancel a few patients and reschedule them, and there's no real impact to the overall functionality of the organization. So that same CT machine, though, in an emergency room context, and if that becomes unavailable, now you lose the ability to triage patients and the hospital might have to go on diversion. That has a big impact on patient care. So if we kind of look at that model, we can see that it's, um, A, more critical to protect the one in the emergency room than the one in the outpatient clinic, and B, if we're thinking about the incident response, we can more easily bring the one in the outpatient clinic down for service than we can the one in the emergency room. And we need to start to put that kind of context around um, security within healthcare. And I think that's the problem is you can't do everything. We all have limited resources and the hackers only have to be right once. We have to rewrite every time. I mean, that's classic security line, right? Uh, so it sounds like, that, is that what the playbook helps you to do is to kind of prioritize these, including, and you make a great point, clinical context. Yes, clinical context is definitely increasingly important. I do think you need more and more of a partnership between the security team and the clinic, clinical team and in both directions. I think it's more important, it's very important that clinicians, A, understand that cybersecurity does play a role in patient safety in a modern mm -hmm. hospital, but it's also important on the cybersecurity side that we begin to understand more and more the roles these devices play in patient care. And that's one of the things the guidebook tries to point out is it divides guys, uh, devices up into seven classifications. So basically it ranges from devices that are perfectly safe to disconnect from both the patient and the network something like a uh, wireless blood pressure cuff. Yeah. The wireless connectivity there, it's mostly a convenience. It's not gonna impact operations. If the nurse has to enter in a blood pressure, it's quick to do, yeah. it's easy. It's just a convenience. So there's no, nothing stopping you from disconnecting from the network from the patient. Then you have cases like the CAT scan machine, where that's gonna have a patient care impact if that device becomes unavailable. There's other situations like, let's say a telemetry monitor. You can disconnect that from the network safely, um, that's not a problem, but if you do disconnect it from the network, it's going to change the nursing workflow because now it might require more frequent rounding because the vitals can't be transferred to the computer used to monitor you know, those vitals. So it does have an impact on patient care in that sense. And we kind of look at the patient care impacts of various devices and how it'll be impacted if you disconnect the device A from the network and B from the patient. And we kind of divide the devices up into seven different classifications. And um, for each classification, we propose a incident response process that will minimize the risk to patient care. Now, with that being said, this is kind of generic guidance. Um, every hospital has to kind of reestablish this in their own context of their own devices, their own patient population. But the whole idea of the guidance was to kind of get the conversation going and showing how you have to incorporate this clinical context into the incident response process. And that was my question is, so how should they use the playbook? Is it something that's just meant as a way to inform them as the potential process or it, does it have a format that they can use to do their own planning? Like, How should someone use this playbook if they're at a healthcare organization? It definitely has a format that everybody can use. I think it, it sets the stage well to form a basis for that. It's just a matter of the organizations tweaking it for their own tool sets, for their own context in terms of patient care. Uh, so, for example, um, the playbook starts with some recommended tools that we feel are essential for every hospital to correctly respond to a medical device incident. But we do it in a vendor agnostic way. So, for example, you know, we recommend having a NAC appliance or something similar to segment stuff on the network. Uh -huh. but your own particular incident response process is going to vary a little bit depending on, you know, which vendor you have your appliance from. Sure. 
So we can't lay out an exact roadmap just because we tried to keep it vendor agnostic. So, so that's one factor that would take a little tweaking in terms of um, the organization lens. And the other side is that different organizations do treat different patient populations. So if you're like at say a psychiatric hospital where you have a specialized set of patients, your patient care needs might be different than a hospital that provides more generic acute care. And there might be some need to tweak the, the playbook according to that as well. But the important thing is, is it, it does set a framework for hospitals to begin to have those conversations. So it lays out an overall way for them to actually break the devices down and for them to consider how you can adjust your incident response process to deal with each class of device. So this is kind of a psychological question, but isn't it kind of scary to do this type of process, right? I mean, like, you know, is that why they avoided ignorance is bliss? I mean, or, you know, how do you overcome that psychological barrier of kind of seeing that your baby's ugly, right? I don't know if that makes sense. Like, you know, like, it, you know, or, or, you know, how would you look at that in, in kind of looking at this challenging, you know, the challenges you face as an organization? I think a lot of cybersecurity people tend not to worry about it until it becomes a reality. And yeah. with medical device security, people have been warning about the risks of medical devices for years and years, but up until a couple of years ago, they were still largely theoretical. It wasn't mm-hmm. until the WannaCry attack in 2017 where we saw the uh, cyber attack actually encrypt medical devices and cause a patient care impact. So it's only been the last couple of years where medical device attacks have actually been not just theoretical, but have actually been a reality. So uh-huh. it gets people thinking about it more and more now. And you know, as you mentioned with the changing the dosage on the infusion pump, now that's not something that we've seen in a real attack yet, but it also doesn't mean that we should ignore that completely because just because it hasn't been observed in the real attack doesn't mean that it can't happen. Um, so I think what's important and what this guidance does is it starts to get this conversation going. And I think that's the, one of the main things is as an industry, we need to really start having this conversation around clinical context because it is one way to minimize the patient care impacts of cyber attacks going forward. Yeah. So are there other key elements or features of the playbook that, uh, that you'd like to highlight as well? I love the ones at the beginning showing some actual kind of case study <laughs> of this could happen, which I, I like that. Any other features or elements that you'd like to highlight? I think the main other feature is that we did try to also lay out the various tools that are required to do an incident response process properly. Because one of the things that's unfortunately common in a lot of hospitals is they don't yet have a robust security function. A lot of hospitals are still lagging in both security talent and security investment. And this not only tries to set the standard for how the incident response process should be, but makes suggestions for the types of toolings and resources required to actually respond properly. So it's something that we're hoping as well gives a little of the uh, hospitals with um, some less resource security departments the ammunition they need to begin to acquire the tools they need to actually keep patients safe. That's awesome. Um, So how often would you suggest that practices, you know, medical organizations really go in and kind of update their environment, update their approach to this playbook? Is it something you do annually? Is this, you know, how do you, would you approach kind of this effort of understanding, you know, your response to medical device incidents? It's something that is going to vary somewhat between organization to organization because each organization is a little different. I would definitely recommend that organizations review their incident response plans on at least an annual basis. I'm also a big fan of conducting a tabletop exercises and other simulations to actually test incident response plans because that's a really good way to identify any deficiencies in the plan <laughs> before an actual incident hits and you find out the hard way that your plan's not going to work. Mm-hmm. So I'm a very big fan of doing that on at least an annual basis as well as a way of putting the plan to the test and making changes. But in addition to just an annual process like that, anytime there's going to be a major change to the environment, if you're introducing, you know, some new medical devices or a new part of the hospital, there can also be events that might trigger the need to uh, reevaluate things as well. Yeah. If WannaCry hit again, you'd be revisiting it, right? (laughs) Oh, sure. As a threat vector, some other stuff changed as well. Yeah. um, correspondingly change your plans to deal with it. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, where can people learn more about the playbook and are there any other organizations or maybe people you want to recognize that help contribute to it? Sure. The uh, playbook is found on the Cloud Security Alliance website. Uh, We have a list actually of other resources in the playbook as well, which does reference things like the um, 
older Cloud Security Alliance and OWASP on Secure Medical Device Deployment Standard, which focuses less on the incident response side and more so on uh, tactics that hospitals can use to actually protect medical devices. And you know, as mentioned, it, it's a team effort. Um, I'm you know, happy to thank all the contributors who participated in the effort. It was great working with everybody. And in particular, uh, Brian Russell, who co-led the effort. Awesome. Well, Chris, I love interviews like this because I go away feeling like I was educated, <laughs> understood the problem much better. Uh, you're so articulate in understanding this. And thanks for putting together this playbook. And thanks everyone for watching. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareitday.com. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.